My name is Blake James, my IL 564 Law and Ethics, uh, Dr. Kaiser. Uh, during our presentation on unethical behavior of educators, uh, the, the four people in our group was I, myself, Kay Johnson, Twyla Lavender, and Casey Lipscomb. Uh, Casey and I both work together here at Ohatchee. Uh, Kay is at JSU, and Twyla works at a Floyd Elementary as a collaborative teacher. So we have two collaborative teachers, a project administrator, and a science teacher. Um, <clears throat> Alabama Code of Ethics, just kind of introduce this a little bit, was adopted by the State Board of Education back in 2005. This is it defines the professional behavior of educators in Alabama and serves as a guide uh, to ethical conduct. Uh, maybe back in 2005 because it's really been a problem with different educators, with different teachers throughout the state in the past 10 to 12 years uh, and not you know, showing ethics, not being moral in, in their job, and not showing professionalism as educators. Uh, schools and school systems are responsible for ensuring that all educators and other school employees who have contact with children are familiar with and act in accordance with the Alabama Educator Code of Ethics. It's pretty much what the Code of Ethics says. To me, it's, it's a shame, honestly, that you have to even think about this as a, as a professional, as an adult, that we have to act responsibly when you should always act responsibly in any, in any profession. Uh, these were our three hot topics that we looked at throughout our research paper and as a group, the social networking of the students, inappropriate sexual behavior, and cheating of educators on state assessments. Uh, the first thing, social media and education. So social media can be a great educational tool, but if not used properly, can cause major trouble for schools and educators. Uh, through social media in the past probably, I guess, five years, it's really come on and using it. Uh, we're using Facebook, using Twitter, using these different things in the classroom. But using it educationally is really the way it's meant to be used in a classroom instead of teachers talking to kids on the internet about inappropriate things, playing games with kids through these different social media. Uh, aspects that we have, different websites that we have. So to avoid those pitfalls, uh, we got to set boundaries for ourselves personally and educationally uh, through these different social media interactions. You know, you know, you got to show professionalism at all times when, when dealing with social media and education, even while you're home. Some of the tips that we had for educators was to keep posts professional and age appropriate, ensure student confidentiality, only post about related educational material and do not post personal agendas or opinions. And that, that, that last one really is a, is a biggie when it talks about personal agendas, opinions, not really a good uh, thing to, to put out there. Maybe what you think about your principal, maybe what you think about your superintendent or a state law that's going on. You have to act professional at all times when it comes to using social media because it's always going to be there. You really can't ever believe it. Uh, some of the other things we, we said, you know, do not accept friend requests from kids. Don't accept friend requests from parents. You know, maybe one of the only exceptions is if they're immediate family, something along those lines. Uh, set, set your account to private so that you're the only person that can see it. You know, you can set it to private, uh, but still in the end you shouldn't be doing things that should make people, you know, want to say that, hey, why is their account private? You should be able to just be posting stuff about education about you know your family and things along that nature and never posting anything that could be incriminating against yourself. Uh, like it says they're refraining from posting incriminating photos or media, alcohol, drugs, any of that type of stuff and get your teacher certificate gone in a hurry. Um, Here we are, the inappropriate sexual behavior with students was the second hot topic. Uh, in 2014, it says 781 cases of teachers were accused and convicted of sexual relations with students. Pretty big deal there when it comes to, you know, how an adult can have sexual relations with kids. It just blows my mind. 781 cases is a, is a large number since Texas was leading with 179 cases reported in 14, and Alabama investigated 31 cases from January. July of 2013, tripling the number of cases since 2009. And one of the main things to me as to why this happens is back to the first the hot topic with social media, with, with, with teachers talking to kids behind a phone, behind a, you know, a computer, things along that nature. That Therefore, those people, you know, they, they, they can really hide and, and then it leads to other things. And then you have the sexual behavior that, that occurs. Um, the student teacher uh, sex law in Alabama says no student, no school employee can have sex with any student under the age of 19, even with consent, is considered a class B felony. Um, 
you know, you will get charged criminally for it and sentenced up to 20 years in prison. You must register as a sex offender. Registering as a sex offender is not going to help your cause and getting another job ever. Uh, it's one of the worst things you could possibly do. But you, there is a little bit of controversy with it because last year we had a judge in the state of Alabama for some reason come in and declare that that 2010 law is unconstitutional and saying that if they're 19, they're both consenting adults, that they can have sex. In my eyes, it is the craziest thing I've ever seen. Um, even he said if they're 18, that this could happen. Uh, this cannot happen as a professional, cannot happen as a teacher. Any type of, of, of sexual behavior with any student um, says that the teacher is not an authority over the student. So that's saying that this teacher from this school, from, from school A, is in a relationship with different from school B. No, they are still, you know, doing the same thing. They're still, you know, getting in the mind of that kid, making that kid probably do things that they really wish they weren't doing. And then it says if the teacher abuse their power and coerce or groom the student, then therefore that would not be good either. Uh, some of the things of cheating on state assessments, high stakes tests just puts pressure on educators. It, it's simply one thing and that's money. Money is, is cash flow for these school districts when it comes to doing well on these, uh, doing well on these different tests, these high stakes tests that we have. Uh, it's a predictor of success. You have less policies where the state comes in to look at you. And you're also a peace of mind for administrators and for the teachers. So you want to do well on these high stakes tests. Um, how do they cheat? You know, you give tests, you give uh, answers to kids before the test, or you change the answers after the test has even begun. When the kids get ready to turn it in, the teachers go back and change them then. So there's many different ways that this happens. And in, in, in some instances, uh, teachers have just taken the test outright for those kids. All because, like we said, that one thing, money, it, it plays a big role. Why do teachers cheat? Uh, financial bonuses. A lot of times, if you make really well on high stakes tests, you're going to get more extra money. I know with AP, um, you get $100 a kid through A plus college uh, rent grant that we have here at Ohio High School. So that could maybe entice a teacher to maybe want to cheat some. Uh, fear of a job loss. If, you, if your state is a failing school, if, you're, if your district's a failing school, you don't want to lose your job. You've got to still keep paying your bills. And you get pressure from above. You get pressure from principals, you get pressure from administrators, from, from superintendents, and so on and so forth. And then uh, some of the consequences, you can get your certificate revoked, you can have criminal charges, it's considered fraud. All of this cheating on these assessments would be. And then how to combat it? Maybe let the state come in and oversee these different tests, let, let them have each person sit in a certain room while these teachers are giving these tests so it doesn't happen. Or you can do a little bit of score variation there. Don't take into account special ed scores. Don't take into account the ELL scores where they might score lower than your average kids. So those are some different ways on the state assessments. Uh, the, the, you know, the last couple of things here, just pretty much everybody needs to make sure that you advise and you stay ethical and to your morals, know the Alabama Educator Code of Ethics and use it to uh, guide behavior in all professionalism. Constantly be professional, constantly show good ethics throughout the entire time of your profession, throughout teaching. So it says failure to engage in ethical behavior in these three areas will likely result in loss of one's career and teaching credentials as well as possible criminal persecution. And then here are our references that we used throughout each of our power each of our research papers to make our power.